tell you a little bit what we're going to do today. So one of the things that we do at PPG that we've done from the beginning is we try and integrate arts and culture into everything that we do. Um, and often we start meetings or events with poetry or music or dance or video. Um, so we're going to start this session. I'm going to show you a spoken word performance by a local artist named Brandon Williamson. And um, it's called Buffalo Wings. And that's about a five minute or so video. Um, and then I'm going to tell you just a little bit about PPG and Cornell and Buffalo. Um, then we'll set a little context for Buffalo Niagara region, its history and geography, why that's relevant to understanding poverty and inequality here. And then I'm going to share with you three tools that we find useful in understanding poverty um, to understand poverty in terms of what's typical versus what's disproportionate, to look at poverty through three different lenses, individual, group, and society-wide, and then to focus on income and expenses. So those are the three tools that hopefully you'll learn today. Uh, but before we get into any of that, we're going to watch this video called Buffalo Wings. My name is Brandon Williamson. I am uh, born and raised here in the city of Buffalo, New York. I'm a performance poet. Performance poetry is when you take a message and you relay it not only in the words, but also the performance of the upset poetry. It's when you can put your emotion, your um, energy, everything behind your words. And I am doing a poem called Buffalo Wings. Buffalo Wings is a poem that speaks about the, not only the city of Buffalo, but also our hidden nature to cover ourselves up in sauce while leaving the you know substance behind us um, falling apart. And so very similar to Buffalo Wings themselves, um, we cover all of our wings in sauce. It doesn't necessarily mean we're good at cooking wings, it just means that we're good at covering things up with sauce. And uh, Buffalo suffers from the same thing, it's covered up with a lot of razzle dazzle. Um, but not necessarily focusing on the substance and everything that makes the city what it actually is. How to make buffalo wings, or if you're from Buffalo, how to make chicken wings, one. Pour Frank's Red Hot Hot Sauce into a pan or a bowl if you're using a microwave, which is perfectly acceptable, too. Mix in butter and apply heat. Now, while waiting on your sauce, chop up some cilantro and onions and toss them directly into the trash, for they have no business near your wings, three. Stir your sauce and apply to your wings at your own discretion. Once you've properly made good buffalo wing sauce, it doesn't matter how well or poorly the wing is cooked in buffalo. We focus on the sauce, almost as if to cover up the fact that we don't always cook things thoroughly. I find myself trying the wings in every city that I go, but no one has this recipe down quite like the city of Buffalo, covered up in sauce to hide the parts that are undercooked. Add a little spice and buffalo to draw all eyes to the inner harbor so the inner city gets overlooked. Lick a few fingers, butter up a few palms, put on a mask of progress, but keep it off the books. Why else would we send you to Anchor Bar? We know that Duff's wings, but never mind. Look, Canada. Your buffalo wings are terrible. And that's my favorite thing about you. You should never master such deprecating skills. Mom, Dad, is this a recipe you used? Did you build my, build my world up in fantasy while your clouded reality rained flames down around you? Did I wade so deep into the safety of your seasoning that I drowned in the desires that you had for me? Was I your sauce? <laughs> is this where I get it from? My need to put on a performance for the world while I burn to the ground. My desire to walk through fire in order to emerge the hero. It doesn't matter how long the wing is cooked, as long as the sauce is good. Do I taste like buffalo? Great taste like canal side, but less feeling like downtown. Did I get the recipe right? And it's a west side flavor with the blunt smokiness from east side gunpowder. Do I taste like home? 
Do the charred parts of me grow bitter on your tongue? Does my dark meat offend you? Are you convicted by the crunch you hear when you tear into my silent body? I am not here to be your hero. I will not save you from your own emotions. I will not offer you a watered-down, more palatable version of me to save you from your own discomfort, and you shouldn't expect anyone else to either. Maybe it won't always be all right. But that's why we created this recipe, right? So I won't tell you, I won't talk too much about that video. We can discuss it during the Q&A. If you weren't able to see the video, uh, if you were only getting the sound, then um, at your leisure, go to YouTube and type in Brandon Williamson Buffalo Wings uh, so that you can watch the video because the, the visuals are very good as well. Um, but here's a quote from the poem that um, really expresses some of the themes that we'll be talking about throughout the next three weeks. Uh, no one has the recipe down quite like the city of Buffalo, covered up with sauce to hide the parts that are undercooked. Add a little spice and buffalo love to draw all eyes to the inner harbor so the inner city gets overlooked. Similar treatment of that theme is this cartoon from the Buffalo News cartoonist Adam Zeiglis. You can see that the man lying on the sidewalk has a, a hat that says East Side and it's titled State of the City. Um, so drawing attention to the fact that as many people have remarked, Buffalo is experiencing something of a tale of two cities where downtown, the waterfront, the medical campus, Hurdle and Elmwood, Larkinville, a few other neighborhoods are experiencing a lot of growth and development and prosperity, uh, but many or most of our residential neighborhoods and people who live in them are not necessarily really sharing in that growth uh, or the fruits of it so far. Um, so just a little bit about PPG Partnership for the Public Good. Uh, we're a community-based think tank. And what that means is that we help our partner organizations with research and advocacy, advocacy um, really about what government could or should do better. And we represent now over 300 partner organizations and they range from little block clubs all the way up to big service agencies and, and other coalitions and collectives. So we have a number of tools that we use to help our partners with public policy work. And maybe the most important is our community agenda. And this is just a, a shot from our website of the, the first few items on this year's community agenda. So this is our partner organizations getting together and voting every year on their top policy priorities for the coming year. And they're listed in the order um, of the number of votes they receive. So this really guides our work throughout the year. And um, we visit with our partners. We go to all our local elected officials and we advocate for the items on the community agenda. So if you see, you notice this year, the, the top one was had to do with traffic fees and their racially disparate impact and the impact they have on people living in poverty. The second one had to do with policing and uh, creating law enforcement assisted diversion where police officers can take people directly to social services instead of arresting them if their real problem is one of mental health or poverty uh, rather than really criminal intent. And those uh, are two issues where we've seen a lot of progress already this year, I'm very happy to say. Um, when something's on the community agenda, that usually means it's a hard thing to do and often uh, our partners don't succeed, but, but many times they do, and we're seeing some real progress on those issues this year. So that community agenda is one important thing that we work on. We do a lot of events, um, a lot of workshops, a lot of public education. You can see that um, often it's very timely topics like the Buffalo Police Budget, uh, but it's also things that have more to do with sort of improving capacity throughout the community. So the, the second example was about service learning and, and making that better at our local colleges and universities. We have a toolkit on our website. So anytime you're trying to make change or learn more or get involved in the community, we have all kinds of tools for doing so on the website. And 
for example, if you haven't really worked with elected officials before, that can be kind of intimidating or bewildering. Um, so we have a lot of tips for you on how you go about meeting with elected officials and um, asking them to do something differently, persuading them to do something differently. Um, really at the heart of our work is research and action research. So research that's designed to help our partners make change. Um, and so if you go to our website, this uh, section of it called the Buffalo Commons is where we house all of our own research, but also any research that we find that's relevant to Buffalo Niagara and its issues, whether it's done by local academics or people outside of the university system who do different kinds of research. Um, you can find everything we've found here in the Buffalo Commons. It's got over 400 fact sheets, policy briefs, reports, articles, videos. Um, we're adding artwork to it, all kinds of things you can find in the Buffalo Commons. So I hope you'll get a chance to spend some time there uh, at some point as we go along. The Buffalo Commons is an example of a collaboration between PPG and Cornell. Um, from our beginning, we've been housed in Cornell ILR's Buffalo office. Um, ILR is Industrial Labor Relations. It's one of the public facing parts of Cornell University and it has long had an office in Buffalo. And um, many of us work for both um, PPG and Cornell. And one of our other projects that I'll just highlight is the High Road Fellowships, where we bring over 20 Cornell students to Buffalo each summer and place them as interns with PPG partners. Um, they spend the summer typically in Buffalo, working with the partners, and then also um, learning about Buffalo, learning about economic development, equity, community development. Um, and getting course credit as well as uh, stipend for their time here. This year, uh, of course, they couldn't come here and all live in a dorm together, but we actually were able to succeed in keeping the fellowship alive, and they are working virtually from their homes around the country, uh, but they are virtually spending the summer in Buffalo and, and doing some wonderful work. And so that's uh, a few examples of the interrelationship between PPG and Cornell. Um, so now we're going to turn to Buffalo Niagara and just a few brief words to set the context because issues of poverty and inequality are different depending on where you are and Buffalo's context is important to what we'll be talking about for the next three weeks. Um, you can tell an awful lot about Buffalo and its history just from its location. The fact that we are the easternmost tip of Lake Erie and the fact that in 1825 they finished the Erie Canal, which was the most important public works project uh, of its time and unlocked just tremendous economic activity throughout the whole country, all of it flowing through Buffalo. Um, and of course, Niagara Falls, um, not just as a tourist attraction bringing 10 million or so people a year, but as a source for inexpensive hydropower. Um, so you put those things together, Lake Erie, Erie Canal, and Niagara Falls, and cheap hydropower, and you start to see uh, Buffalo boom as a logistics center, as a place where goods are moving through. But once they're moving through, you start storing them, and then you start doing things to them. To them. So you start storing grain and grain elevators, which were invented here, and you start making things like Cheerios, and bread and other products. Uh, and then as iron ore starts coming through in massive quantities, it makes a lot of sense to site factories and industry here. Uh, and so you get things like Bethlehem Steel and Buffalo booms as a place for logistics and for manufacturing uh, for over a hundred years. But then of course, those manufacturing jobs um, start to leave until today, if you think about the Buffalo and Niagara economy, it actually is not uh, more oriented toward manufacturing than typical regions throughout the country. In other words, our economy is now not really uh, a manufacturing economy. It's a very typical blend of education, uh, government, uh, retail operations, uh, medicine, uh, finance. Um, those are the big sectors now. They're quite a bit bigger than manufacturing in our local economy. 
But that history of, of booming with manufacturing and then losing so many thousands of jobs um, until we sort of stabilized at today's pattern, that has an important impact on all the things that we'll be talking about um, throughout the next three weeks. So if you look at Buffalo Niagara's population over the years, that's quite an unusual picture. Um, there are parts of it that are very typical. So the suburbanization that happened in pretty much every city in the country where the suburbs became, for many reasons, more popular places to live than the inner city, and the city lost population compared to the suburbs. But what's more unusual, um, and it, this only happened in a few places in the whole country, um, Buffalo and Pittsburgh, Youngstown, Ohio, a few places like that, among the more major metros, is that we started losing population, not just in the city, but in the region as a whole, uh, back in the 1970s as those manufacturing jobs left. Um, but important to note that even as our population was declining, we were still spreading out geographically throughout the region. So the red on the map that you see there is all the places that used to be rural, uh, but became urbanized between 1950 and today. So even as we were starting to lose quite substantial population, we were still sprawling out into um, what are now the suburbs and exurbs. And that development pattern has important consequences for the themes of these seminars um, for equity issues. If you think about Route 33, uh, which was built to connect the people who were now living in the suburbs to the jobs, many of which were still in the city. Um, think about what that did to the east side of Buffalo, what it did to beautiful um, Olmstead Design Humboldt Parkway, but also what it did to the homes and businesses of the largely African-American neighborhood that it tore through. Um, think about what it did to Buffalo, the city of Buffalo's housing market, when all that housing was being built in the suburbs and exurbs, even though the population was declining, it meant uh, large numbers of vacant and abandoned housing in the city. And that development pattern only exacerbated the racial segregation that already existed in the region. So if you look at the dot map uh, on the right-hand part of your screen, that shows where people of different races live in Buffalo. And that's Main Street that is dividing the largely white west side of the city from the largely African American east side. And you can see how starkly, even inside the city, Buffalo remains segregated. Um, but there's also a lot of segregation by race and income when you compare the city to the suburbs. So that's just a, a lightning quick um, tour of Buffalo's history and geography and economy to help set the stage for our delving deeper into understanding poverty. But what we're gonna do now is learn these, these three tools that, that we find helpful at PPG and, and, and hope that you will as well. And the first one we're gonna focus is on is differentiating between what's typical about poverty and what's disproportionate about different groups living in poverty. Um, and we're gonna try and learn to sort of combine both those things in our brain at once without mixing them up. Um, so to do that, we're gonna do a little thought experiment together. And we're gonna imagine that we all work for Time Magazine. And the, the, the editor of Time Magazine has seen the latest census figures and seen how many millions of people are living in poverty in the United States and, and they wanna do a cover story on it. So they come to us, uh, we're the photographers, and they say, we need a picture for our cover of Time Magazine of the most typical American family you can find that's living in poverty. Of these 40 or 50 million people living in poverty in, in the United States, what would the most typical family uh, look like? So first we need to just decide where we're gonna look for this family. And so ask yourselves, um, where, where should we go as these time photographers looking for the typical family in, in poverty? Should we go to a city, a suburb, or a rural area? Uh, and I think many of us would think well, we should probably go to an inner city or, or to a rural area in Appalachia, uh, but we'd be wrong. The most typical family living in poverty in the United States today is living in a suburb, not a city 
a rural area. Um, okay, so now we know where to go. We're going to the suburbs. Um, now we're thinking what race or ethnicity should this most typical family be? Should it be white or black or Hispanic or other? Um, and the correct answer based on census figures would be white. Uh, the most typical American family living in poverty would be white in its race and, and ethnicity. Um, now we're wondering, okay, what, what should the education level of the parent be in this family? Should it be someone who completed high school or someone who dropped out? And again, we might be surprised when we look at the actual numbers and we find out it would be more typical to have graduated high school than to have dropped out for a person living in poverty in the United States. Uh, we're wondering about family structure. Should it be a married couple, single mom, single dad? And this, this is the one question that uh, we might get right uh, if we're thinking about this for the first time because the, the most typical family structure would be a single mother uh, with children. Um, now we're wondering how many kids should this family have? Should it be a big family or a small one? And some of us, I think, will be surprised when we learn it's a small family. It's going to be either one or two kids living in this most typical family. So who are we talking about? Who's going to end up on the cover of Time magazine? Well, she might look something like this. A white suburban mom, high school graduate, um, with one or two kids. Um, She's probably worked some, at least in the last year, but probably at a low paying job. She might be a medical technician like this person here might be, or a nurse's assistant. She might be a home health aide. She might work in retail as a cashier or a, a salesperson. Um, but she's gonna look something like this. Um, now, imagine that we ask everyone in America and we say, please close your eyes and imagine uh, the most typical family living in poverty in America. Do you think that this kind of image is what they're gonna picture? And probably not, right? They probably have a different image of what they think is typical about living in poverty. And so the question is why? You know, why do we tend to get it wrong? And one reason, of course, is stereotyping. Um, so for many, many um, decades now, there's been stereotyping in our media, um, in our conversations, in, in everything in our culture uh, where we make certain assumptions about people and often those assumptions are wrong, but they get reinforced every time we turn on the television or look at a magazine or um, talk at the water cooler. Um, and so that's a way in which um, just wrong information is infecting our brains. But there's also a way in which correct information is confusing us. And that's this key distinction between what's disproportionate and what's typical. Because if you're talking about poverty rates, uh, the rate of people living in poverty for different groups, then the answers are very different than if you're talking about most typical. So if you're thinking about geography, for example, um, city versus suburbs, poverty rates are much higher in the cities of Buffalo, Niagara Falls, and Lockport than they are in the suburbs. Um, the poverty rate in the city of Buffalo is over 30%. For the region as a whole, it's only about 15%. So it's, it's more than twice as high in the city. Um, so how could it be that the more typical family would be living in the suburbs? Um, even in Buffalo, Niagara, where the urban-suburban disparities are worse than other places. And the answer is that so many more people live in the suburbs than in the cities in the United States today, that even if the rate is lower of poverty in the suburbs, the absolute number will turn out to be very similar or even higher in most metro areas than in the city. Um, similarly, if we're thinking about race and ethnicity, poverty rates are much higher among people of color. So if you look at some Rust Belt type cities, Buffalo, Milwaukee, Cleveland, Rochester, Pittsburgh, they all have very similar racial disparities in household income. On the left of the bars is African-Americans, on the right is whites. 
And you can see that, for example, in Buffalo, Niagara, the median household income for whites is 56,000 some, for African Americans, 25,000 some, so more than twice as high uh, median income for whites. Uh, the rate of poverty among African Americans is uh, much, much higher than that for whites. But of course, there are a lot more white people in Buffalo and Niagara than there are African Americans. And so, even though the rate is lower, the more typical person living in poverty is going to be white, not African American. Similarly, if you're thinking about wealth, and in, in this country, as in many, wealth is very tied to home ownership. You can see that home ownership rates are much higher for whites, 72% in Buffalo and Niagara compared to 34% for African Americans. 33% for Hispanic Latino. So those rates are extremely different. And um, just take a brief moment to acknowledge the impact of the COVID epidemic on these inequities um, and note that it's, it's really just reinforced them, made them even worse and sort of laid bare how unequal the world of work is in the United States. So this is looking at um, renting households, and renters are at more risk from COVID than homeowners because they live in denser patterns. Um, so we're looking at renter households, and on the left, where the, the bars are highest, that's the lowest income. On the right, where the bars are lowest, that's the, the highest income. And you can see that the lower your income, the more likely you are to have at least one member of your home employed in a high-risk occupation. 78% um, for people living in poverty compared to 8% um, for people uh, with more than twice the median income. Um, this tells the same story, but by race instead of by income, showing that people of color are much more likely to be working in at-risk occupations than are whites. So this question of um, typical versus disproportionate is going to be really helpful for us. And we're going to try and remember both things. So if we were designing an anti-poverty program for Buffalo and Niagara, it would be really important for us to know that more people are living in poverty um, outside the city now than in it, uh, outside the cities than in them. Uh, and yet that poverty rates are much higher in the cities and the poverty is densely concentrated in the city. So if you're thinking about designing a program, you can see how it would be very helpful to know both of those facts and to keep them both in mind because a lot of the people that you serve are gonna be spread out, but the worst effects of poverty come when you concentrate it and you're gonna find that concentrated poverty um, in the cities. Our second tool is three lenses for viewing poverty, viewing it at the individual level, the group level, and the society-wide level. And to understand these three lenses, we're going to do another thought experiment. And this one involves apples. So you're going to be seeing these apples for a while. So what you need to imagine now is that um, we're all located in the same room. Uh, we're in a big room. And there are 100 of you. It was a very popular lecture, even more popular when it was in person. So there are 100 of you. But you're all really hungry. Um, they forgot to supply food. And the only food available is a bushel of apples that I brought. So I have a bushel of apples. There are 100 of you. I only brought 90 apples, though. And I dump them on the floor. And a mad Hunger Games-like scenario occurs where everyone rushes for apples. And 90 of you get apples. Uh, but 10 of you don't. So 10 of you are suffering from apple deprivation. And I'm trying to understand why. So I'm going to look at this through some different lenses. So I start by looking at it through an individual lens. And I wonder, what is it about those 10 people who didn't get apples? What about them as individuals explains why they didn't get the apples? Um, so let's say that Amber and Diane were two people who didn't get apples. And I look at them both as individuals, and I notice that Amber has a, a sprained ankle. She's wearing an East bandage. So I say, oh, okay, that's why she didn't get to the apples fast enough. And um, I, I talk with Diane, and I find out that she has some motivational issues. 
Um, she just really wasn't feeling motivated to go face this Apple challenge. So I designed individual interventions for both of them. I, I um, send uh, Amber to the doctor for a sprained ankle, and I get a life coach for Diane, work on her motivational issues. And those are both very successful. Uh, they're both 100% cured. And so the next time this happens, I dump out the 90 apples. Um, 100 people try and get them. Uh, but do I still have a problem? Even though Amber and Diane now get them, it turns out that there are 10 people, other people, who didn't get these interventions maybe, who didn't get the apples. So now I think, hmm, I want to look at this through a different lens, this problem of the apples. I'm going to think about what is it about the 10 people as a group, not as individuals, but what about them as a group would help explain why they didn't get the apples. And I look around the room and I notice, oh, the 10 people who didn't get apples were seated in the back row, the farthest away. So there was, the game wasn't fair. There was a structural disadvantage that they, those 10 people had. They had a group disadvantage. Um, so, okay, I can figure out how to cure that. So the next time we do it, I put all um, 100 of you in a perfect circle. And I drop out the 90 apples, and it's 100% fair. And yet it seems we still have a problem, don't we? Because still only 90 of you got apples. So now I'm going to think one more time. And this time I'm going to use the society-wide lens that looks at all the people and all the apples together. And I think to myself, OK, what is it really that explains why 90, only 90 people are getting fed? And then I can come up with two different kinds of solution. I could figure out a way to bring more apples, bring 100 apples for 100 people. That's one kind of macro solution. Um, or I could make applesauce. I could divide up the apples equally into slices, or I could make applesauce, and everyone would get 9 tenths of an apple. So I'd have a different solution at each level, depending on what lens I was looking through. So now let's we'll pause for a minute, and we'll think about translating this example back to the world of public policy and the question of why are people living in poverty? So if, if we answer this question of why are people living in poverty at an individual level, um, that could be very helpful in explaining certain things to us. For example, here are two brothers. One of them grows up and becomes wealthy. One lives and ends up in poverty, even though they were raised in exactly the same situation. Um, I'd have to look at individual factors. Was one lucky? Uh, was one lazy? Was one unhealthy, um, what, what were these individual factors that helped to explain it? Um, and this lens would be very helpful, for example, if I was giving an individual person advice about how to stay out of poverty, I could say, for example, well, stay in school. The higher, the more education you get, statistics show the less likely you are to live in poverty. And that would be a very powerful individual solution um, to staying out of, uh, uh, out of poverty. But that doesn't really answer the question of group inequity, does it? Because imagine now that instead of two brothers, we have two boys who um, follow all that good advice about staying in school and uh, staying out of trouble. Uh, but one is white and one is black. And now they're applying for jobs. Um, and the white boy, the white young man, it turns out, has a better chance of getting a job even though they have the identical qualifications. And that's been proven in a lot of different ways over the years. But one of the most powerful ways are experiments where researchers send out resumes to employers, and the resumes are matched in pairs that are identical except for the names, where one name sounds as if it's probably white and one name sounds as if it's probably black. And this experiment has been done in many times in many ways. And it always comes back that if you have a white sounding name, you are much, much more likely to get callbacks and interviews than if you have a black sounding name, even with identical uh, qualifications. In fact, if you, in one experiment, the white names that also had felony records 
right on their resume, it said that uh, the person had a felony uh, for, for um, sale of drugs, they got more callbacks than uh, African-American names with zero criminal record. So it's a very powerful example of a group structural disadvantage that can't be explained by at the individual level. Um, and yet, if you remember that when we solved the group problem, we still had the problem of not enough apples. Um, that helps to explain why we still need to go to that society-wide level. And the best way I can explain that to you is to say, is to imagine what if, uh, we'll, we'll use the example of education because it's so powerful at the individual level and at the group level at um, influencing poverty. But now when we think about it at the society-wide level, so we imagine that every single person in Western New York gets a PhD. Our educational system is so amazing that every single person in Western New York has a PhD. So one of those people works here at the 7-Eleven as a cashier, and they go to their boss and they say, uh, you can call me doctor now, I have a PhD in economics, and I'm ready for my raise. Um, and the boss says, ha ha, um, I really don't care if you have a PhD, cashiers at 7-Eleven um, get paid this, and that's how much you're still gonna make. Um, about one third of the jobs in Western New York are that kind of job, a low paying service sector job. Uh, salespeople, security guards, landscapers, home health aides, uh, bus aides, et cetera, et cetera. That's about a third of our jobs. Even if we all had PhDs, one third of us would need to work those jobs. Those jobs have to be done. They're what we now know as essential jobs but they wouldn't pay anymore if we had PhDs. So what does that mean? It means that education is very powerful predicting which people live in poverty, but not that powerful at predicting how many people live in poverty. It tells you about which more than it tells you about how many. It sorts people into different groups that have better or worse access to jobs that pay a living wage, that pay enough to keep, keep you out of poverty. <clears throat> so that's our second tool, is to look at poverty through those three lenses. Our final tool is to think about poverty in surprisingly simple terms. Poverty means that you have too little income and or too high expenses. And when we think about poverty in these simple terms, it turns out to be surprisingly powerful when it comes to solving poverty, when it comes to doing something about poverty, to actually reducing the poverty rate in a society, in a country, in a state, in a city. Um, it's going to come down to public policies that raise people's income and lower their expenses. In a way, it's much less complicated than poverty at the individual level, because individuals are so complicated. Um, they have all kinds of problems and issues that might contribute to them living in poverty or not. But at the macro level, it's a lot simpler. It's income and expenses. So most people's income comes from work. So if we're thinking about what to do about poverty, we're gonna start with wages, but not everyone can work. Uh, some people are temporarily unemployed or they're disabled. So we're going to need to think about what their income is as well. But for most people, it's going to be work. So we're going to start thinking about things like minimum wage policies and the fact that the federal minimum wage is today $7.25, but it hasn't gone up in years. So inflation has eaten it away. In the 1960s, it was actually worth more than $10 an hour in today's dollars. Um, so that's a very powerful tool for workers living at or near poverty is, well, what's the minimum wage? That'll determine a lot about who lives in poverty and who doesn't. Uh, and that's why so much of the focus on poverty has been around raising minimum wages or creating living wage policies that lead to higher wages. 
but for people who can't work, people who are disabled. If you're permanently disabled, then the federal program that exists to help you is SSI. Uh, the SSI level for a single person in 2020 is $9,408 a year. That's what you get from the federal benefit, uh, federal government in SSI payments uh, over the year if, if you are permanently disabled and living in poverty. Well, that's a lot less than the poverty level. So essentially, we have a federal policy that people who are permanently disabled and have no other source of income should live in deep poverty. That's a choice we've made as a society. Um, it's not some naturally occurring phenomenon or disease that afflicts us. So when we think about income, we're going to think about things like that. When we think about expenses, we're going to think about the simple basic costs that a household living near or in poverty has. And we're going to think about what public policies would reduce people's costs for housing, utilities, food, child care, et cetera, et cetera. And in our next two seminars, we'll talk more about what that looks like in the real world and what policies work well, what innovative things are happening here in Buffalo and Niagara around those. Um, but for today, um, I'll just mention one that we might not think about so much, but is very important, and that are expenses that people in poverty pay that they really should not be paying under any circumstances because of businesses that have a business model of exploiting them and extracting money from them uh, in ways that are often illegal, and if they're not illegal, they probably should be because they're deeply unfair. And so an example of that would be the rent-to-own industry. Um, this is a way of selling people goods at very inflated prices, interest rates, by pretending that it's really just a rental agreement, not a sale. Um, no one really wants to rent a sofa or a television, um, but it's created as a, rental per, uh, as a rental because that helps these businesses get around state usury laws that prevent you from charging too much interest. Um, so we'll talk about a lot of different sectors and tools, but I just want to flag that one uh, for today, the idea of you can lower people's expenses by better regulating businesses that exploit them and sort of artificially exploit, uh, expand their expenses. Um, so that is our lightning tour of three tools for understanding poverty. Hopefully you've been chatting, um, typing some questions into the chat. Um, and we've got some time now to answer those, and we'll save even more time for Q&A in our next two seminars. So if we don't get to questions today, we will pick them up at our, um, at our next, uh, in our next sessions.